card making can be an expensive hobby, but I think it's worth investing in supplies and tools that make my card making better or easier or just more fun. Let me show you some of my big crafty splurges. The first couple are probably pretty common. Way back in like 2010 when I was making some wedding invitations, I sunk about $150 into my Dolly 550 trimmer. They're pretty easy to find now, even on Amazon. But back in the day, I had to hunt it down at a specialty office supply store. It's pretty industrial and there's nothing flimsy about it. The rotating blade is housed in a protective case and I have never replaced it. Not only do I use it on cardstock, but I've trimmed down all my storage pockets and even my dividers with it. If I ever feel like the blade's dull, I just run it up and down a few times against that metal edge of the platform and it's good as new again. It is big and it takes up quite a bit of space on my desk, but I can't imagine a day when I'm not using it. I think the tools we use every day for every cart are the best place to invest our money to get the greatest amount of return. This one cuts accurately, although it's not so good for small pieces. And I do have a very small trimmer that I use for evening up sentiment strips or cutting very small rectangles and squares. Next is my Gemini Junior. I've had this one for just over five years. When I started card making, I had a cuddle bug and then a big shot like many other crafters. When the electric cutters came out, I thought that it was crazy to invest in one, unless you needed it because you had a problem with cranking a handle. And there's still a part of me that feels like I don't need this. It really is a luxury. But I really enjoy how easy it is to use and it's been really reliable over the years. And I've never had a problem with it. I have two small additions that are extra splurges. Well, the first one's really only about $10, and that's the turntable underneath my Gemini Junior. Again, definitely not a necessity, but the ability to turn the machine as the plates go through and easily grab them from the back makes this tool even more of a pleasure to use. And this one, which is a splurge and may not even be available anymore, is this iCrafter Magnetic Pro Deck. It's a rigid cutting plate with a self-healing coating on it, so even after more than a year of use, it's unwarped and undamaged but it's also magnetic, so I almost never need to add tape when I'm cutting. At the time, I think this one was about $70, but I haven't had to buy new cutting plates since I got it. I use one cutting plate as a top plate and a green plate as a shim underneath to protect the self-healing surface from the rollers, and I get great cuts every time. I do have to replace the green plate maybe two or three times a year, but they cost a lot less than those clear cutting plates. Next is my Misty. Well, let's lump in all of my stamp positioners here. I have a Misty, a Mini Misty, I have the Altenew stamp wheel, and I have the Sizzix stamp and stencil tool. I did a video a little while ago comparing all these tools, and I'll link that right here. And I know they're not cheap, so having all of these really is a big splurge. You definitely don't need all of them. But as a tool that makes crafty life easier, I cannot recommend enough that you have one of them. The ability to re-stamp in the same place saves your cards from being ruined at the last minute when you're adding your sentiment, and also, if you're like me and you make multiples, a positioner is so useful for making that job much easier. Next is my blending brushes. I know, I know, everyone says to get the cheap ones on Amazon and that they're no different. And that may be true. I haven't tested that. I have the small and mini blending brushes from Altenew. I made the move to the small ones because I really prefer to hold the brush right over the bristles and not with a handle. I feel like I have more control this way. Plus, I found the ones with the handles were a bit awkward to store. These ones are in a drawer with cardboard dividers that I made myself to fit them perfectly in a fridge bin. The mini brushes are great for blending in smaller areas, and they give a feeling of almost coloring with a marker or crayon. I store mine in these marker holders from Stampin' Up, and that keeps them in order, in reach, and easy to use. They give full coverage easily in small areas where you want more depth of color. Now, it is easy for them to get saturated with ink, it just rub it off on a microfiber cloth and then you're ready to go again. Next is my double dies. Yes, I have a couple of areas where I actually bought the same die more than once. The first one was an alphabet set. You know that alphabet sets generally come with one of each letter and many of the words that we like to use like happy, birthday, merry, Christmas, need multiples of a letter. That wasn't what made me give in though. It was when I lost the Y. Without Y, there's no happy. No Mary, no joy. So I caved and I bought a second set of the letters. I figured I would immediately find the Y as soon as it arrived here, but I actually have never found it. And what I did find is that it's so much faster and easier to create custom sentiments when I have two of the letters I need most. 
Now I can cut each of happy birthday, Merry Christmas in one go. So that's one example. The other one was with a much cheaper die or a couple of dies. These spellbinder dies are really fun to make patterns with, but to make patterns, you need lots of them and cutting them one at a time is not fun at all. Because they were so little, they were quite inexpensive and I was able to get a couple more of each. And even if you just get one more, you cut your die cutting time in half when you want to build a card like this. My most recent craft room splurge was an upgrade to the pocket system I've been using for years to store my stamps and dies. There were things I loved about my system and there was one big thing that was really not working. So I finally took the plunge and I made a big, big change. And that's the topic of my class in the upcoming free Paper Crafters Get Organized Summit. I've put a link in the description below so you can get all the information and register for your free ticket. I'll be going in depth about my previous system, what I loved, what I hated, and how I figured out how to fix it. But I'll also be sharing a five-step process so that you can find your perfect storage system. I really hope I'll see you there. Now let's keep going with a couple of my more unusual splurges. The first one is my rotating platform grip mat combo. You've probably heard me say this a hundred times, but this really is a game changer if you like to ink blend or color. The grip mat holds the cardstock in place and it sticks pretty well to the platform. Not perfectly since that surface is not perfectly smooth, but usually well enough to hold everything in place, especially with the pressure of the ink blending or coloring I'm doing. Once you're all set up, the ability to turn your surface so that you can comfortably color or blend your ink makes such a difference. No more awkward reaching or picking up and moving the cardstock, just quick and smooth turning. Next is my Stencils 360 and my little Stencils 360 Friends Edition. To be perfectly transparent, these were given to me by Penguin Palace and I didn't pay for them, but I know how much they cost and they are a splurge. But what they give you is an ability to create perfectly circular designs. They can be geometric or there are also wreaths and florals with multiple colors with no masking. They're designed to work with circular stencils that you turn to create circular designs and the guidelines help you know how far along to turn the stencil to create different patterns. I've got a whole playlist showing more about this tool, but if this is your style of crafting, these tools definitely make it easy to create this type of design. And there's a ton of stencils available to make this tool very versatile. And yes, six inch square stencils do work with the larger tool. I still need to figure out how to make them work with this smaller edition, but it's definitely on my list. Now, what about the splurges I didn't make? I haven't fallen down the hot foil or better press rabbit hole. I don't have a Cricut or a scan and cut. And there's probably some others I can't remember right now. And I'm not saying they're not worth it, but by resisting some of the trends, I'm able to focus on the areas where I know I'll get my money's worth. Have you made any crafty splurges? I know each of us will have different areas where we think it's worth spending a little extra money and I'd love to hear yours. And of course, it's all about balance. So now that we've talked about a few of my big crafty splurges, here's a link to a video where I'm sharing some of the cheap and even free craft room hacks that I use. I'll see you over there. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.